Greetings and welcome back to room 303 of the Harvard Classics Lectures. This is lecture 120, Sant Bovas. What is a classic? We are in uh, Harvard Classics volume number 32, Literary and Philosophic Essays. And we now turn to what really is a classic about classics. Now, if it's true that we are the stories that we tell and retell, we're also, of course, the stories we accept or reject, as we have said many times at, uh, in, our, in our conversations at LearnStrong.net and, of course, Room 303, then here we will enter a huge debate within the academy, outside of the academy, about what constitutes this thing called a classic. The famous, of course, notion of this is what Mark Twain said, a classic is a book everyone says you should read and nobody's actually actually read it. Um, we're going we're gonna to take maybe a little bit different tact um, here in our lecture, and we're going to hear what uh, Sampar has to say, and then we'll turn to maybe our own definition of what is a classic in, in our studies in, in room 303. Just to remind our learning theory is of course trying to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. I'm hoping that I will be able to give that kind of a lecture um, to you today here you know, on the 12th of January 2021. Very recently we have of course lived through some incredible times in the last year. Of course culminating with just a few days ago the storming of the American Capitol by a group of protesters turned rioters. Is there anything that our study of the classics can say about that experience? We'll hope that that will be the case at the conclusion of our, of our study here in, in a bit. Of course, our three levels of reading, what does the text say, what does it mean, how can we relate to it in some way at level three, and of course at level three we're hoping that we can play that game. Uh, just a little bit about uh, Charles uh, uh, Augustine uh, St. Beau, um, born in 1804, dies in 1869. He's a very important French literary critic, um, and his view was that to understand a work well, one must understand the biography. Later, of course, the great Proust will argue in many ways against this. Uh, the influence of an essay like this on, for example, a, a 20th century theorist like T.S. Eliot can't be overstated. He will die in Paris at the age of 64. Let's just turn to his essay really quickly and get a sense of what it is that he is asking. Of course, the title of the essay is, What is a Classic? And the very opening line is, A delicate question to which somewhat diverse solutions might be given according to times and seasons. No truer line could be written down. What is it that constitutes what we think about as a classic, or what W.B. Yeats will call monuments of unaging intellect in his sailing to Byzantium? He will say, this is a delicate question. We would, of course, maybe say a difficult question, right? Because there's always been this debate about why is it that we have to study certain stories as more important than other stories, and therefore we'll call them sacred or classic or traditional or whatever you want to call it. Like, why is that the case? Well, let's listen to what he has to say about a classic. And again, I wish, as I often say in these Harvard Classics lectures, that I could just read the whole thing to you, but we don't have the time. So let's jump into a few of the lines here. He will say in the second paragraph that a classic, according to the usual definition, is an old author canonized by admiration and an authority in his particular style. Then he goes on to talk about the etymology. The word classic was first used in this sense by the Romans. In other words, this is the most classic or traditional, forgive the pun, of any kind of definition of a classic. It ends up on a list of texts that you should be familiar with if you are going to be, how does one say it politely, well-read or well-educated. This is a very old idea. He says, at first, the only true classics for the moderns, and he obviously will consider himself one of those, writing roughly 1800, okay, um, well, um, um, uh, for the only true classics for the moderns were the ancients, right? The Greeks, by particular good fortune and natural enlightenment of mind, had no classics but themselves. They were, at first, the only classical authors for the Romans who strove and contrived to imitate them. And of course that word imitate is central, right? That is to say one of the understandings traditionally about classics is we try to imitate in some way those classics. After the great periods of Roman literature, after Cicero and Virgil, the Romans in their turn had their classics who became almost exclusively the classical authors of the centuries which followed, the Middle Ages, which were less ignorant of Latin antiquity than is believed, but which lacked proportion and taste. Obviously, any time we get into the discussion of classics, we're going to get into this discussion of taste, confuse the ranks and orders. 
Ovid was placed above Homer, Boethius seemed the classic equal to Plato, the revival of learning in the 15th and 16th centuries, what we call the Renaissance, um, helped to bring their long, this long chaos to order, and then only was admiration rightly proportioned. Thenceforth, the true classical authors of the Greek and the Latin antiquities stood out in luminous background and were harmoniously grouped on their two heights. Meanwhile, modern literatures were born and some of the more precocious, like the Italian, already possessed the style of antiquity. Dante appeared and from the very first, posterity greeted him as a classic. A few lines later, the idea of a classic implies something that has continuance and consistence and which produces unity and tradition, fashions and transmits itself and endures. Now, we're going to get obviously to the great debate that Tilly Olson will pick up in her classic silences. Why is it then that so many of our traditional classics are the dead white males? That is to say, there's a certain understanding of how these texts became quote unquote classics. Let's stick with the essay and then of course we'll come back to have some further discussion in a bit. He says, the dictionary of the Academy of 1835 narrowed the definition still more and gave precision and even limit to the rather vague form when we're talking classics. It describes classical authors as those, quote, who have become models in any language, whatever, in quote. And in all the articles which follow, the expressions, models, fixed rules for composition, style, strict rules of art to which men must conform, continually reoccur. That definition of classic was eventually made by the respectable academicians of our predecessors in face and sight of what was then called romantic, that is to say in sight of the enemy. So we have classic versus romantic is now a, a, a kind of a, a, a distinction that's being made. It seems to me time to renounce those timid and restrictive definitions and to free our mind of them. A true classic, and now we're actually going to get to his observation, a true classic, as I should like to hear it defined, is an author who has enriched the human mind, increased its treasure, and caused it to advance a step, who has discovered some moral and not equivocal truth, or revealed some eternal passion in the heart, in that heart, where all seemed known and discovered who has expressed his thought, observation, or invention in no matter what form, only provided it be broad and great, refined and sensible, sane and beautiful in itself, who has spoken to all in its own particular style, a style which is found to be also that of the whole world, a style new without neologism, new and old, easily contemporary with time. Such a classic may for a moment have been revolutionary, it may at least have seemed so, but it is not. It only lashed and subverted whatever prevented the restoration of the balance of order and beauty. And then, quoting Guta and other important thinkers and theorists, he then will begin the process of trying to parse out what classics are within his own time period. He says a few uh, paragraphs later, indeed, before determining and fixing the opinions on the matter, I should like every unbiased mind to take a voyage around the world and devote itself to a survey of different literatures in their primitive vigor and infinite variety. What would be seen? Chief of all, a Homer, the father of the classical world, less a single distant individual than the vast living expression of a whole epoch and a semi-barbarous civilization. He continues a few lines later, um, in reaching the modern world, how would it be? The greatest names to be seen at the beginning of literatures are those which disturb and run counter to certain fixed ideas of what is beautiful and appropriate in poetry. For example, is Shakespeare a classic? Yes, now for England and the world, but in the time of Pope, he was not yet considered so. Pope and his friends were the only pre preeminent classics directly after their death, they seem so forever. At the present time, they are still classics, so they deserve to be, but they are only of the second order. So he's going to play Shakespeare above Pope, for example, and are forever subordinated and relegated to the rightful place by him who has again come to his own on the height of the horizon. And obviously at LearnStrong.net we've given lectures on any number of the authors that we are now talking about, including obviously Shakespeare and of course Pope. He will talk about uh, Dante. He says, nevertheless, let us acknowledge our age's part and superiority and greatness. True and sovereign genius triumphs over 
the very difficulties that cause others to fail. Dante, Shakespeare, Milton, that will of course be the holy trinity of T.S. Eliot, and we talk uh, at length about that in our lectures on, especially uh, Wastelanded for Quartets at Bernstrong.net. Dante, Shakespeare, Milton were able to attain their height and produce their imperishable works in spite of obstacles, hardships, and tempests. He'll say a few paragraphs later, there's no question of sacrificing or deprecating anything. I believe the temple of taste is to be rebuilt. In other words, this is an interesting idea. Classics will be reinvented as classics over time, and we will have new texts that will be handed on to the quote-unquote classical, traditional, we might say canon, right? But its reconstruction is merely a matter of enlargement so that it may become the home of all noble human beings, of all who have preeminently increased the sum of the mind's delights and possessions. He says, as for me, who cannot obviously in any degree pretend to be the architect or designer of such a temple, I shall confine myself to expressing a few earnest wishes to submit, as it were, my designs for the edifice. And then he'll begin to consider the power of a Shakespeare as uh, beginning, obviously, this more modern attempt, obviously starting with Homer is where we will begin. And for him, there are any number of names that, that will be mentioned. Virgil and Horace, and we've already mentioned Pope. Of course, Montaigne, who is such an influential, he wrote a famous, uh, um, wrote a famous essay on, on Montaigne, um, and we've given a lecture already on Montaigne. Um, Voltaire, Addison, uh, Plato, Sophocles, these will not be shocking names for us in our studies together. Dante, Boccaccio, of course, as well as uh, Lucretius. Um, and then he will finish this classic essay by saying, but why speak always of authors and writings? Maybe an age is coming when there will be no more writing. This is, of course, already predicting the age that we now live in when increasingly fewer and fewer people are, in fact, reading the quote-unquote great classics. Obviously, we're going to try and make the argument, we'll do it here in a little bit, that probably it makes sense to at least go back and look at some of these classic texts from time to time, right? Happy those who read and read again, those who in their reading can follow their unrestrained inclinations. There comes a time in life when all our journey's over, our, all our experience is ended, there is no enjoyment more delightful than to study and thoroughly examine the things we know, to take pleasure in what we feel, and in seeing and seeing again the people we love, the pure joys of our maturity. We've said this many times in 303. You will read so much of what you're reading now in your late teens and early 20s far differently when you're 50, right? In other words, you'll come back to them, it seems to, it seems to us. Then, it is the word... Classic takes its true meaning and is defined for every man of taste by an irresistible choice. Then taste is formed, it's shaped and definite. Then good sense, if we are to possess it at all, is perfected in us. We have neither more time for experiments nor desire to go forth in search of pastures new. We cling to our friends, to those proved by long intercourse. We've often said to you that in the next 10 years, you're going to try to find the text that will sustain you for the rest of your life. Different texts for different, uh, for different ones of us. Go back again to our comments in Bacon's of Studies. You'll, you'll remember he says some few books are to be fully digested, right? There's only a small handful of texts that will become for you the classics, right? We cling to our friends to those proved by long intercourse. Old wine, old books, old friends. We say to ourselves with Voltaire in these delightful lines, let us enjoy, let us write, let us live, my dear Horace. I have lived longer than you, my verse will not last so long. But on the brink of the tomb, I shall make it my chief care to follow the lessons of your philosophy, to despise death and enjoy life, to read your writings full of charm and good sense as we drink an old wine which revives our senses, end quote. And then the final paragraph of this essay, in fact, be it Horace or another who is the author preferred, who reflects our thoughts in all the wealth of their maturity, or some one of those excellent and antique minds, shall we request an interview at every moment of some one of them shall we ask a friendship which never deceives, which could not fail us. To some one of them shall we appeal for that sensation of serenity and amenity, we have often need of it, which reconciles us with mankind and with ourselves. This notion of reconciliation as a classic definition of classics, I think, is central. In other words, what is it that we're saying? Well, in many ways, we will borrow in 303 from this definition of classics to say the following. So let's now go to work with our definition in room 303 of what we will qualify as the classics. Classics 
are texts of any kind which will speak to our now. That is to say, if the text speaks to us in some profound way in our present condition, then we will call it a classic, not some text that ends up on some list that we feel like we have to read if we're going to consider ourselves educated or we're really interested maybe in getting certain Jeopardy types of questions right in a certain kind of trivial pursuit way. No, no, no. We're talking about the titles that can sustain us in some way through the experiences of our life. Of course, individuals who will claim that titles of the antiquity and of the past should not, in fact, be studied at all, we will often say about those kinds of arguments, well, that's just another story. And again, go back to our original ideas. We are, fundamentally we are, the stories that we both tell and retell as well as the stories we accept and reject. But as we've often said in 303, and we will say it now about our study of classics, let's not reject a text until we know the text. That is to say, we must give every text its opportunity and its due, just as we will say out of respect, we must give all individuals proper respect and due. Right? Think of it this way, just to finish our lecture. Let's play the game now of the situation that we just recently witnessed in the storming of the Capitol building by some protesters who obviously had some serious um, uh, destruction in mind as they walked in. And of course, we even saw tragedy and death as a part of this project. I'm not interested in arguing the politics at all of this. We'll do that and legislate that elsewhere. We are, of course, interested in asking a simple question. Can any texts help us at all to understand What's going on? That we're living through a strange time is obvious, but how can we qualify it in some way through the study of certain texts? I think we can. Let me just give you a few titles that maybe will come to mind, and then we'll finish with some final observations. What about Dickens' Tale of Two Cities? The genius uh, um, uh, opening lines, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, is obviously we're talking about London and Paris, and of course more particularly that revolution, the storming of the Bastille, a number of us who, of course, know this title will recognize the power of going back to that title to help us understand. That is to say, when people begin to act in irrational ways, in groups, we think obviously of uh, uh, Arthur Miller's Crucible here, don't we? We have to ask about what is it that are the motivations that stand behind these actions, right? Or, for example, since we mentioned Homer in our discussion, what does Homer's Odyssey have to say about the insanity of what has been go what we witnessed just a few days ago? Well, think about it this way. When Odysseus is down in the underworld, Tiresias tells him the only way you're getting home is to go between a rock and a hard place. That is to say you must sail between Scylla and Charybdis. And the, uh, your ability to do that, you can't sail around it, you got to go right through it. Well, this is of course going to be for us a central teaching. When we are politically in dark times, we have to go through these times. We can't go around these times. The only way out is through. What about Hamlet? Right? I mean, I asked the question on the morning after the storming of the Capitol, the group of AP students, because we were at the moment studying Hamlet. What is the text Hamlet as a classic, if we are willing to say it that it is? What does it have to say about the events that we just witnessed? One of our students reported, you know, it's interesting, think about it. The only way Hamlet's daddy dies is somebody poured poison, not somebody obviously being Hamlet's uncle, his stepfather, and obviously the brother to King Hamlet, Claudius, poured poison into the ear. In the same way, because of the poison being poured into the ear, Denmark becomes a rotting state. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Think about the power of words and the ways in which, as Hamlet will call it, words, 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 can lead to all kinds of horrific types of action. Even, of course, political action as it relates to the movement of large numbers of people, sociologically speaking, right? What about, and this one, of course, will make us all smile, because it's one of those classics which will speak forever, it seems to us, right? What about Golding's Lord of Flies? Think about the power of the study of that novel as it relates to some of the things we have been witnessing. The power of, for example, a jack to be able to rule through all kinds of manipulation of language and fear. How does he settle his disputes? Dropping rocks on Piggy's head or, of course, burning down the entire island just so he can take care of, of uh, Ralph. Right, And, of course, we commented on this in our lecture on LearnStrong.net about Lord of Flies. 
But the irony of all ironies, of course, is that, hello, we're burning up the whole island so that we can get our chief enemy, and once we've got our enemy and we kill Ralph, then what will we live off of because we've burned up the entire island? Of course, the irony is that the smoke from the burning of the island actually works. Back to the original plan of Piggy and Ralph, we've got to have some kind of smoke signal. Only who shows up? Well, it isn't just some fisherman, is it? No, it's, of course, right, ironically, darkly ironically, it's a marine who is there in the, in the area. They are doing what? Practicing war games. Well, what are war games? Well, of course, part of war games are practicing dropping rocks on an enemy's head to settle conflict, which is, of course, what's going on on the island. Right? We read that novel going, well, if only there were adults there. I mean, these are children, and so we can cut them some slack, because obviously they're kids, and so they're stupid. If there were only adults there, we wouldn't be dropping rocks on each other's head to resolve conflict. Of course, conflict resolution, and a way to resolve conflict without violence, these classics will often say, that's not such an easy thing. Go back to our study of the Iliad or Virgil's Aeneid comes to mind. Finally, think about Dante in our comments in our studies of the Divine Comedy, and especially the Inferno. Poor Dante the Pilgrim. He has had enough by Canto 24. He has seen enough, smelled enough, heard enough, and he's done. And he sits down. What is it that Virgil has to say to him as his guide? Up on your feet. This is no time to tire. In other words, you've got to keep going. You cannot just give up. Of course, we find in our study of Dante the longing when we are in the midst of some really tough times. We long for a voice that will tell us, get up, keep going. That's what a classic is. It speaks to us in that moment to say, get up, keep going. And can we, for example, say with Whitman in his uh, Song of Myself, passage 46 and of course 47 to continue it, I have the best of time and space. It was never measured and never will be measured. I tramp a perpetual journey.